Welcome everyone uh, to the CVMA's Veterinary Town Hall series. Uh, my name is Dr. Enid Stiles. I'm your Canadian Veterinary Medical Association president. I am currently at work, so I don't have such an elaborate background today, but uh, <laughs> it's the best that I could do. And I'd like to welcome, of course, our uh, speaker, Dr. Scott Weiss, uh, very much for taking us through this on a, a now pretty much monthly or bi-monthly uh, uh, webinar of navigating through COVID-19. Thanks for having me back. Uh, like Enid said, we'll, we've got lots of time for questions. You know, I always say that I end up talking more than I thought I would, but uh, we've got a few key points I want to go over, but if there are any points for discussion, that's what we really want to focus on today. So I'm going to give a little bit of an update where we are. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into that, mainly just to help us you know, think about the horizon and what we need to be doing in the interim. I've got a couple of main topics I want to hit on. One of the big ones is ventilation, an area we haven't talked a whole lot about. Uh, just to put into context where we are, so a tale of four countries up here. Canada, we're in the top left. Hopefully those of you can see it on the screen. Uh, we're very much in a second wave. We're hoping the second wave is peaking, but we really don't know at this point. You know, we had the first wave, we dropped back in a good summer. Now we're into our second wave, as is fairly typical. Uh, the one beside the top right is the U.S., which has, you know, never really dropped down. There's the first wave that merged into a second wave, was second to third wave. Um, they may be plateauing a bit too. This is an example of different things that we, you know, we, that we can do. The bottom left is Australia. And Australia has got a really good example of first wave, good control, dropped down very low. Second wave came in and they brought in very aggressive measures and they've dropped it down very low again. They haven't done this half-hearted drop like we've been seeing in other countries. Now they have the advantage of not having a big border with the US, but they also have better compliance, I think overall, and less resistance to things like masking. And if you look at Australia now, like they're you know, not normal, but they're pretty close to normal. People out shopping, public things, schools going on. There's not a huge restriction that's happening there because they were very aggressive and implemented a really strict lockdown for a short period of time uh, and got a response. And that's been the messaging is if you try to do too weak of a lockdown or a restriction, all you do is restrict without a lot of benefit versus the short-term pain for long-term gain approach. Now, the bottom right I want to highlight, uh, just because you know we're talking about the second wave, um, we're obviously in the second wave, there's almost certainly going to be a third wave. Uh, we may be peaking the second wave, it's hard to say, but as, you know, regardless of what happens, as this wave comes down, probably because new restrictions will come in, things will decrease. But if we don't have high population protection through immunity or vaccination, inevitably there's going to be another wave that's going to come up until we get that population protection. And that's not going to happen for a while. So if we look at the bottom right, this is Israel. So first wave, second wave, controlled, now they're heading into a third wave. And the discussion there is, do they need another really aggressive lockdown to blunt this fairly quickly? So I think for us just to be aware, um, things are gonna get better, you know, this wave should get under control, but I think we're expecting, or at least wouldn't be surprised if we have a third wave in the spring. So just something to be aware of long-term. Uh, I won't go over the data too much. Just if you look at numbers, we know that there are certain parts of the country that are differentially affected. Within provinces, there are big differences too. In Ontario, we have some really high rate regions and some low risk regions. Uh, Alberta has been a concern for the last you know, few weeks or more with very high weekly case rates. Um, the Atlantic bubble has still been amazingly good. You know, the Atlantic bubble gets compromised a little bit. You see PEI, the R values, so the RT, the reproduction number, I mean, the number of people that get infected by your average infected person, you know, they're in a, a concerning zone, but they've got a small number of cases. You know, with a small number of cases, this is very labile. One person infects a couple of people, that looks artificially big. So, but PEI is being aggressive because they want to keep themselves in that nice, low, kind of successful Atlantic level. So we've got a big difference that's going on across uh, the country. So knowing your regional risk is really important. Uh, quick animal updates. Uh, critter on the right there is a dog named Macy. You probably heard about her it was about a month and a half ago. She was our first confirmed positive dog. Uh, we've had seropositive dogs and cats through our serological study. She was the first one we've detected through active viral shedding from swabs. 
Um, the reason it took so long is just, I think, a logistical issue. So for, for that study that we're doing, we identify households that have COVID, we go in and we sample the animals in the households. So logistically, you know, someone's got to get COVID, they've got to get their test done, they've got to get the result back, they have to contact us, and we get in the house to do the sampling. And I think we're often missing infection. Because if we look at some data we have and some other country data, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, 20 to 40% of cats in positive households get infected. Most of them subclinically. Some get sick. Usually it's kind of a mild upper respiratory disease. But it seems that it's probably fairly common we're getting human to cat transmission. And we just haven't picked up many because of the time lag. Dogs, there's still a debate whether dogs get sick. Um, you know, my impression is most don't. Some might get a little bit sick, just very mild disease. What we're getting anecdotally, what we're hearing mainly in our seropositive dogs is they were a little quiet. Um, and that, that's largely about it. Cats, more sneezing, more classical upper respiratory tract signs. There is a report of a fatal infection from Europe who was a pretty solidly diagnosed COVID case in a cat. So I think cats will get this gamut of disease, usually subclinical, otherwise typically classical upper respiratory infection with some potentially serious disease. Dogs are the, the easier, the better end of that spectrum, most often normal, but I wouldn't rule out some degree of disease. I think that's assessing the patient, right? If you have an indoor cat that doesn't encounter any other animals and it's an adult and it all of a sudden comes up with acute respiratory disease while the owners have COVID, well, the cat probably has COVID too. And, you know, is that, is that relevant? Well, probably inconsequential because that cat doesn't go anywhere. But where it does come into relevance is for us, right? So if we say that, you know, a pretty high percentage of cats and still a reasonable percentage of dogs, maybe 10 to 20% get infected, dogs... Do they pose a risk to us? I don't know. I'm not convinced dogs pose a risk to us when they're infected. Cats, I think, probably do to some degree because cats can transmit a cat to cat experimentally. So if they can transmit a cat to cat, cat to human seems to make sense. So this really reinforces the importance of querying household status. So if there's active COVID or a realistic expectation of COVID in the household, especially if it's a cat, we certainly need to be concerned that they might be infected. Again, it's probably a short period of time. Um, but if we get them in that sweet spot, there is a few days where they might be infectious. There's a question coming up, do ferrets get COVID? Um, yes, they do. We don't have great field data on ferrets because there aren't a lot of ferrets and they don't get tested very often. Uh, experimentally, they get sick. Well, they don't always get sick. They can get sick. Um, they can transmit it ferret to ferret. So, you know, the realistic transmission of, tra of it from ferrets to other species. Mink, I'll get to later, are very closely related, obviously, and they're very susceptible. So I think ferrets would be higher risk than cats, in my impression. We just don't have a lot of them. That said, we have a household where we had suspicious infection in a group of ferrets. And this was probably a timing issue. They had inconclusive PCR results, borderline PCR results, which might be really early or really late infection. Uh, we couldn't confirm it was a positive, but my guess was there, there was human ferret transmission. So if you're dealing with ferrets, same thing. Um, you know, ferrets are more susceptible. Do they pose more of a risk than cats? It's hard to say. There's, you know, less respiratory exposure with a ferret than a cat, just a cat's bigger than a ferret. So does that wash out at the end? But I think the key really is thinking about household risk status. And whether it's dog, cat, or a ferret, being aware of that. Dogs being probably low risk, but we're not going to say zero. So if you've got a COVID positive household, again, the messaging is, if you don't need to see the animal, let's give it a couple of weeks. If we need to see the animal, that's when we bring in a rat of PPE we've talked about in the past. Uh, kind of related to this, we have two studies going on right now that we're still re recruiting for, so I'll put a shameless plug in for that. Uh, one is our PCR-based study. So this is you know, confined pretty much to the, the Guelph, you know, hour away area. So active COVID in the household, where we go in and sample those animals in the household because we don't want them leaving the household. We're also doing a serological study uh, that can be Canada wide where we're getting serum from animals that have been in COVID positive households. So a few weeks prior, uh, a few weeks and beyond prior, if they've been exposed to someone with COVID, we can enroll them. So there's not a biosafety risk there handling the animal because they shouldn't be infectious. So if anyone has cases like that, uh, we're recruiting veterinary staff uh, in large parts, it's easier to get samples. So if anyone is interested, certainly feel free to track me down. Um, just another qu question there or comment there. One ferret in a family showing upper respiratory owner as a cough and never got tested. It was quarantined for two weeks. So that's when you kind of just have to leave it as, was it COVID? Quite possibly. Without the owner being diagnosed, it's hard to say because ferrets can get other respiratory viruses from us too. Uh, if they had influenza, 
probably unlikely because we don't see a lot of flu activity, but we can see human flu transmitted from people to ferrets. So that's one where I'd say, yeah, it's probably quite reasonable the ferret was infected uh, and the person had COVID, but not something we're going to be able to confirm. Uh, just in different species, I'm not going to go over different species risks. We've kind of hit on that in the past. I've done a series of these, I think 10 or 11 different species or species groups. Uh, if you go to our Worms and Germs blog website, or if you go on Twitter, at we center source Scott, we've got them ranging from your typical dog, cat, got marine mammals, uh, ferrets, got some wildlife stuff in there, or non-human primates. So if you're looking for reviews on different species, um, that's there. We still don't know a lot about many of our species. Horses are still a big unknown. From a predictive standpoint, horses might be susceptible. We just have no surveillance. I suspect they're not highly susceptible from a disease standpoint because I think we know there have been outbreaks in racetracks and grooms, not surprisingly based on their housing, and nothing's been reported in horses, but I'm not sure anyone's actually tested the horses to see if they might get some clinical disease. So a lot of our concern about the animal side <clears throat> has focused on mink over the last you know, few months. So mink are really susceptible, and that's not too surprising because they're close to related to ferrets that we knew were susceptible. I don't think we expect it to be this big a deal though. So we're up to, I think, 11, 10 countries now with outbreaks on mink farms including some very large uh, outbreaks. Denmark just killed about 17 million mink in response to widespread outbreaks on the farms. So this is a concern for a couple of reasons. One is there's an animal health component. Uh, there's a human health component and there's an environmental health component which relates to other animal species. So it's kind of a classical one health issue. So if we look at countries that are affected, this is a map that I've got on Twitter, uh, kind of if you wanna keep track of what countries are affected. Canada, we're not really sure right now. You might have heard, was it Friday, I believe, there was a report of an outbreak declared on a mink farm in Fraser Valley, BC. This is in people. There were eight people that were affected. Given the susceptibility of mink, we have to certainly be concerned that there was human to mink transmission that's happened. Last I heard, mink were being tested, but I haven't heard any results on that yet. Uh, suspect to hear very soon on that, but I think, you know, it's not inevitable, but it's quite likely we'll see transmission to, to mink just because they are so susceptible. We've had an advantage in Canada. We don't have as many mink farms. A lot they're in, the, in Nova Scotia where there's not a lot of COVID. But any situation where we've got potentially infected people, you've got a chance for transmission to mink. And once it gets into mink, it can spread really widely on the farm. And you can get fairly serious health impacts. Sometimes it'll spread fairly quietly, but often you can tell based on morbidity and mortality in the mink. So uh, the issue in Denmark um, in, in particular has resolved around mutation. So like I said, there are a few things we're worried about. Animal health is one issue, obviously. Transmission back to people is a concern because there've been reports now in a couple different countries where people have infected the mink and then the mink have then passed it back to people. Now there aren't a lot of people in contact with mink. So that's a fairly niche population. So the broader concern about that is the mutation aspect from that previous slide. So where this, the story here is, okay, this is in Denmark, which is a very large mink producing country. And you think about what fosters mutation of viruses. Well, any virus mutates regularly, right? It's just a normal random event. But the more transmission that occurs, the greater chance of mutation. And when you jump to another species, probably the greater chance of mutation too, because it might adapt to that species. So a mink farm, when you got thousands of highly susceptible animals in a different species, it is a recipe for mutations occurring. And, you know, we expect to see them when they move into populations like that. Now, often these are just, you know, genetic, you know, curiosities. They help us track it, but they aren't relevant. But some mutations can be relevant. if They make disease more severe if they impact prevention or treatment. And one of the, the key things that's been paid attention to is the spike protein. Now, this is the protein the virus uses to attach to cells, inner cells. And mutations in that spike protein are of concern because you know, that's a vaccine target and that's a therapeutic target, antibody-based therapies. And in Denmark, there are a variety of mutants were identified in farms. One of them um, had some differences that would suggest that it might not be neutralized as well by antibodies. So if they looked at antibodies from people that had COVID, they didn't neutralize that virus quite as well as the normal virus. And this strain is also found in, numer in a you know, fairly large percentage of people in the North Shetland area where there are a lot of mink farms. So the concern is it's gone from humans to mink, it's mutated in the mink to maybe a form that's potentially of greater concern, spread back to mink farmers who then spread it in the community and now it's established in the community. 
we really don't know if, it, if this variation, if this mutation is clinically relevant, but it does raise a concern. And this is why we're trying to keep this thing out of animal populations and why we're paying attention to what it might do when it gets into animal populations. So, you know, we've talked about this as being a one health problem for a while. So where is mutation a concern? Well, it's not really a concern with most of our domestic animals, right? If it goes into a cat, that's probably a dead end host, unless it affects someone in a clinic or it goes outside, but it's not going to affect a large number of people. And we don't have facilities with a thousand cats typically, right? So we don't have this situation that's ripe for mutation and then transmission on. Our food animals seem to be quite resistant to this virus. So not that we're gonna see mutation there. So our domestic species, we don't really have a huge concern about mutation, I don't think, besides the mink. Wildlife are a bit of a concern though. So we need to think about populations where we have a lot of animals and they can pass this thing around, giving it time to mutate and keep it in that population and kick it back to us. And that's where concerns about wildlife come in. And we don't know much about wildlife. And again, this is the messaging for a couple different species. So one of the concerns with mink is infection of people, obviously. The other is infection of wildlife or feral animals. Um, in Europe, there have been some instances where cats have been infected on mink farms, getting exposed probably from the manure. Uh, and then we get into other wildlife species. Certainly deer mice are numerous. North American deer mice are susceptible to this virus. We don't really know beyond that. What we don't want to see is it in you know, raccoons, for example, large populations that live close together, live close to us. You can see how it would bridge from us to a raccoon from various areas or via a cat that might get infected in a household if it goes outside. So we still are concerned about animals, our domestic animals as bridges into some of these you know, other populations we don't know much about. So again, it goes with the messaging, we need to control it in animals. And when people have exp exposed or infected animals in their household, we wanna keep them in the household. I think I'll toss any questions you have or comments in the chat as we go. So I'm gonna change tack here. I put up this slide probably every time for the last six months. Uh, I'm just gonna be really quick on it because if you're trying to think about things we can do in a clinic or any facility, this is really the key. We've got the three C's plus the fourth one, the time component. So closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with many people around and close contact within those settings. Those create risk. And the more we can mitigate each of those, the more we can drop the risk. And the less we can do with one, the more important paying attention to the other is. And I'm gonna hit on ventilation, like I said, is kind of the big one for this. But thinking about whether it's a clinic, whether it's a room, whether it's a setting of any other sort, how we maximize the measures to reduce those four C's, three C's. And the other is the Swiss cheese approach. And this, this is the recognition that I mentioned before that we don't have the magic bullet. And vaccination is not gonna be the magic bullet. We have lots of things that we can do. Masking is really useful. Masking alone won't help us completely. So we layer on a bunch of different preventive measures to get a net benefit, right? So we've got lots of holes, but if those holes don't all line up, then we've got protection. And this is again, something we think about in the clinic. What are the things that we can do? Well, we can distance as much as possible. We can ventilate, we can wear a mask, we have hand hygiene, we can limit numbers of people in the clinic, and we can do cleaning and disinfection. Contact tracing isn't really in our domain, but we can do a bunch of these things to reduce the risk. And when we start compromising some of these, it means we have to do others really, really well. So if for some reason we have crappy ventilation and we can't fix that, other components become more important. If we've got physical distancing issues, then other components be, become more important. So we can't just say, oh, well, we can't do that, it's too bad, right? It's, oh, well, well, we can't do that as well as we'd like, so how do we improve everything else? So the net, there's not much net change. So thinking about the three Cs, thinking about the Swiss cheese approach, CVMA is coming out with an infographic, I think very soon on this, uh, that goes over those two points. But they're, they're really basic measures, but you know these basic things can really, if, if you think about them in the context of the clinic, you can usually come up with some good ideas. Okay, ventilation. Um, I've learned a crap load more about ventilation than I ever thought I would. So we, you know, we've gone through various iterations of how we've approached this virus in terms of its transmissibility, transmissibility and how it's spread. You know, it's largely a droplet virus. So I'm talking, I'm contaminating the space in front of me. I'm making things that travel maybe a few feet in the air. You know, we talk about six feet, you know, it's not the magic barrier. When I'm talking, coughing, whatever, most of the particles that I'm making aren't going that far. Some are fairly small though, some will go a little bit farther. So, you know, the closer you get to me, the higher risk, the farther you get away from me, the lower the risk, it doesn't stop at six feet. And it depends how much virus I'm shedding and what I'm doing. If I'm yelling, if I'm coughing, if I'm sneezing, I'm, I'm sending it farther. If I'm sitting here quietly, I'm probably not releasing as much. So there is an aerosol component of this. 
and that gets built up by you know more infectivity by the person, more time in the area. You know, making a small percentage of aerosols, but the longer I'm there, that small percentage becomes more in numbers. And then how well we move those out, and this is where ventilation comes in. So you know, ventilation is pretty straightforward, right? We're trying to move things away. You know, dilution is the solution to pollution is the concept here. We're trying to take this cloud of aerosolized virus that I'm making as I talk here and move it away because there's an infectious dose. So we can disperse this. Someone in front of me is gonna have lower risk than if I have this cloud that's hanging in front of me and then someone comes there, especially if they're not masked and they're there for a long period of time and other things that come in. So we wanna prevent accumulation of particles. We wanna prevent these clouds from happening. We wanna disperse these clouds if they form, and I do want to get the virus out. Like just diluting it out in the clinic is still a benefit. If we can get it to go outside, that's even better. If we dilute it in the clinic, you know, clinics have fairly big air spaces overall. We can drop it below a, a, probably an infectious dose, but if we can kick it outside, that's even better. So really the idea is pretty straightforward, make indoor outdoor in terms of airflow. Um, I'm not sure how many people will know what their ventilation rate is for their clinic. Most people probably don't. I wouldn't have had a concept of what to look for and, until fairly recently. And there are a few ways you can look at this. You can look at it in air exchanges per hour. You can look at it by liters per person per second for the people that are in the occupied space. We can look at it using proxies for ventilation that I'll come back to. So there are various guidelines that are out there. Um, the problem with these is they're going to be hard to assess. You can bring in an HVAC person that could do it probably. Um, and I will tell, give you a general idea. It's going to be probably based on the day and what's happening. But six air changes per hour, greater than six to seven liters per person per second of outdoor air are the standard guidelines. Um, and that's still pretty low because the general uh, recommendation is less than 25 liters per person per second increases the risk of sick building syndrome. And that's not necessarily related to, to infectious virus risk, but it's showing that you know, we want more ventilation than we have. Typically, you know, especially in older buildings, ventilation is often not very good. Um, so what we want to do is increase the flow rate, ideally limit recirculation, so bring in more outside air. That obviously is a challenge for your HVAC system, it's really cool. So you still have to balance what the HVAC can handle. Um, I'm more concerned about airflow than fresh air. I'd like high airflow with all fresh air, that's the perfect situation. If we can't do that, we still want to maintain airflow with some recirculated air. You know, recirculated air is going to disperse that virus in the clinic. You know, lots of air spaces around, it'll dilute it down. So that's okay, but you know, more fresh air is the better. Another thing that you know it makes sense, but we don't necessarily think about it is avoid direct airflow at head level. Again, it's that cloud, right? If I'm standing there, so let's let's think about the uh, reception area. So if we're letting people in the clinic and we're trying to increase room in your waiting area, you know, you've got a receptionist sitting there all day breathing, talking a lot, you know, we're realistically maybe getting a cloud of aerosols around that person if they're infected. We want to disperse that through better ventilation. If we don't have great ventilation or you want to expand it, maybe we're going to put a fan in there to move the air. But what you don't want to do is have that fan behind the person blowing their cloud right in the face of the person that's going to be in there. So if they're standing six feet apart, if we're actively blowing that cloud at them, maybe that's high risk. So, you know, it's common sense that we're moving air you know, try not to move it right from one person's face to another person's face. It's maybe better to do that than not move it at all. But if we can move it without having that direct flow at, at head level, that's probably better. So, okay, so we think about the, the three things that we can do. So we just have airflow. Airflow is dispersing things, diluting things. So we can improve that the easiest, right? That's, we can do that in the clinic by opening doors, opening windows, moving in fans, cranking up the HVAC. Fresh air, more than the recirculated air is gonna disperse and remove. The more fresh air, the more removal because we're putting air out to compensate. Um, and then there's filtering and filtering is a removal aspect. So that can be in room, that can be above room, upper room, or that can be in the HVAC system, which is, is something that's more expensive and probably not needed. So when it comes to filters, again, there are two things of filtering we're trying to do. One is just move the air. So just that air movement component is great. The HEPA filter component can also help. We don't know how much, but if you've got a high risk area, a HEPA filter, it makes sense, right? So if you've got an area that's fairly small and poorly ventilated, and we wanna move air, we might as well toss a HEPA filter in there too. And you can, the other thing is you can buy them fairly cheaply. So reasonable quality HEPA filter fans aren't too hard to find. They can go on the floor or somewhere around and they will filter things out. Uh, the other approach or another approach is upper room um, HEPA or UV. 
Now, these are more expensive. These are units, kind of an example on the bottom right there, that are mounted above head height. So UV has, you know, UV is very effective at eliminating organisms. It's also potentially toxic. So this is something where you get good UV kill and it's above people's sight lines. Uh, so it's out of a danger zone, but you get a good germicidal zone above the people. So that's one option. Uh, obviously there's more cost there than your typical lower tech fans. And I'm not sure many clinics or any clinics that are actually doing this, but it is something that you can be thinking about, especially if you have, you know, a really high risk area, extra concern, whatever it is. So in-room HEPA or UV filters uh, might help, especially high risk situations. You can also put filters in the ductwork. You know, we worry about this cloud of aerosol. So when I'm making these little particles that float around, like they live around me a little bit, disperse. This isn't measles virus though. It's not something that's gonna stay in the air for hours and get recirculated around and move from one room to another. So having a HEPA filter, having UV and ductwork probably isn't going to do much. It isn't really a recommendation anywhere. So that's an expensive option. It's not gonna have much bang for buck or any bang for buck versus something that's in the room, which has a lot more plausible benefit. So moving air in the room is really key. Filtering air within the room will help. Doing stuff in the ductwork, probably not. Um, so how can you assess this? And this is something that I'm really getting into now. I've, I'm starting to look into CO2 monitoring in clinics um, as a proxy for ventilation. So obviously, you know, we've got a baseline level of CO2 that's in the air and it increases when we're in the room and we're breathing and it gets dispersed by ventilation. So if you go into a, so use a vehicle as a good example. You take one of these in a vehicle, you're gonna start off at about 450 ppm, okay, ambient CO2. You go in there and you sit by yourself for a few minutes, that's gonna start creating sucks. You drop the windows, it's gonna come down really low. You, in, you increase the fan, you turn the fans on, it's gonna drop. You turn the fans on, but recirculate the air. It's not gonna drop as much as if you turn the fans on and you have fresh air flowing through. So it, it's, it's a pretty straightforward concept. So you can use this in a clinic. These things are actually fairly cheap and, and they're not too bad. So just before I get there, just ways you can assess your ventilation, right? You can bring in your HVAC people and they can give you an assessment, uh, which is never a bad idea, but it's one point in time. There's obviously more cost to it. Uh, CO2 monitoring is a pretty good way to do it. You can also, like if you walk into a room and it smells musty, feels musty, like the, the general line from one aerosol engineer I was talking to, she was saying like, if you go into a room and you don't think the air quality is good, the air quality is horrible, get out, especially in this era. So if it feels like your air quality is bad, your air quality is probably horrendous. So looking at uh, CO2 monitoring, so you can buy these on Amazon for under 200 bucks. I've got a few different types. I've got some one fairly expensive one. Uh, and I've got some cheap ones. And you know, for 170 bucks, I think the last ones I bought, these are monitors, but also data loggers, because we're trying to monitor over time and record the data. If you want the one's just gonna give you a number, you know, 150 bucks, uh, you can get a pretty good one. And talking to the aerosol engineers, the stuff you can buy is pretty good. It's a bit buyer beware, um, but they tend to be pretty good overall. So, you know, if you look for one that's got a reported accuracy plus or minus 50 ppm, it's a pretty good indicator. So you can go in there, you know, if your room is under 600, that's perfect. You know, ideally we keep it under 800, um, targeting 600, but under 800 being okay. If it goes up, we need to do something. And that gives you an idea if your ventilation is very good. And you can move that between different rooms. So, and you can see what happens. Okay, well, what happens if we, you know, we have the treatment room, but we open the door. Right, it gets high, does opening the door, does bringing in a fan do something, does changing the HVAC setting do something. It gives you a pretty easy way to, to pay attention to what your ventilation rates are and as a proxy for COVID risk. And it's something that's useful going forward too. Like we're working on this right now. Um, you know, COVID's gonna be done eventually, but it's gonna be useful for influenza, rhinovirus, anything else. This is an indicator of risk of air, aerosol pathogens. So it's maybe a good reminder for us that we can do some things to drop that risk. And from the animal health standpoint too, right? If you've got an isolation and you're putting a kennel cough dog in there, um, get an idea of how much you're moving that out because animals are making CO2 as well, right? So we can assess ventilation fairly easily with these types of things. So something to think about. Uh, like I said, I'm just playing around with trying to get a good idea. We're trying to get some research going on it. So we should have some better idea what our normal rates are in clinics. Um, and how we can adjust that, but uh, some, something that's kind of a useful tool, I think. Uh, there's a question, actually I'll finish up ventilation, then I'll hit that question. So ventilation take home, uh, improve your ventilation, turn up your HVAC, open windows, open doors, bring in fans, anything you can do to increase air movement. 
along with keeping fewer people in there because then you have less stuff to move around. Consider ring room HEPA filters, consider CO2 monitoring, and ultimately, again, the fewer people that are in the clinic, the better. The fewer people that come into the clinic, the easier it is for us to do everything else, and the less severe we have to do to take some of these measures. Um, if you're interested in this, there's, the conversation is an online thing, some good academic articles that are written kind of at, at a general level. This is one written by Shelley Miller, uh, a really good aerosol engineer. So um, it, it's a nice description of kind of basic aspects of ventilation, use of ventilation, air movement, air filtration for COVID protection. There's a questionnaire, where do you buy a CO2 meter? I get them on, the, the cheaper ones I've got, I got in Amazon. Um, you can, if you want an analytical one, there are a couple of companies and I can kind of point you that direction if you want. I've got an analytical one that's about 800 bucks. So they're not horrendously expensive, but talking actually to Shelly Miller, she's the one that kind of put me onto a couple of these cheaper ones. She says the ones that are under 200 bucks tend to be pretty good. Like I wouldn't buy one that's 25 bucks. Um, but if you get that $100, $150 range, they're probably okay. Uh, at least to give you enough of that, because you don't really care if it's 600 versus 630, right? You care if it's 600 versus 800 versus 1500. So all you have to be is in the ballpark. Uh, so I'm going to hit, there's a question there. Um, precautions to take for vets who are traveling the trucks farm to farm. So I, I've covered that before. I wasn't going to get into this one, but I could give the really quick spiel on this. And if there are any other questions, we can hit on that. So trucks, you know, if you're in a truck by yourself, there's not that risk for you. If you're in a truck with a technician, then that becomes a challenge. So, you know, sometimes you get into discussion of like, are you going to be a bubble? So how, you know, how much risk are you assuming from the other person's activity, or are you gonna to try to be as strict as possible? So that if you're trying to travel between places in a vehicle and you wanna reduce the risk, masks obviously are gonna drop the risk, increasing ventilation. So windows down when you can, not really good this time of year, having good airflow within the vehicle. And if you set the vehicle so that the airflow is going through, you know, you can change whether you're recirculating air or sending it out. If you can send all the air out, you're gonna help with that dispersal. Um, and then going farm to farm, a lot of it comes down to the, just, you know, it's the same practices really we do in a clinic, just kind of reverse. So before going to the farm, you know, in the clinic, you know, you'd ask if people have COVID, farm, call them before and see if anyone has COVID. And same general concept. So try to go to a lower risk facility, make sure they don't have COVID there. And if someone does, postpone it if we can. And then distance as much as possible. Do you need multiple people around? Do you need any people around? So try to limit your contact with people. The good thing about farms is there's a lot of ventilation usually. So, and we can typically distance ourselves, but there are some situations where we can't. So let's say you're floating teeth on a horse and someone's holding, you're in that person's face. That's to, needing to think about some of the high risk situations. So I'm gonna wear a mask routinely, you know, we're gonna protect each other wearing our mask. But if I know you're gonna be holding this horse a couple of feet away from me, tossing a shield on or eye protection makes sense in addition to my mask and ideally going to a medical mask at that point because now I'm using it to protect me as opposed to using a cloth mask which is really to protect others from me. So there are a lot of kind of situational things there but really it's the same concepts. If you're in a vehicle with someone maximize the ventilation, avoid contact whether it's a vehicle or a farm with high-risk people, minimize the number of people that are around, maximize their distancing and you can't do that up the precautions such as wearing a medical mask and eye protection if you're going to be close, especially for a prolonged period of time. But I'm happy to take questions more on that after. Um, how are people protecting their staff from the elements outside? Now, this is really tough, right? So this gets into when to allow owners into the clinic because you know it's the time of year that we can't really do uh, curbside effectively for everyone. And you know you can put up tents outside, but once you get a tent that's got you know more than two sides on it, you've basically made outside, uh, inside, outside, right? So it depends on the municipality. Some places say if it only has two sides, it's still considered an outdoor structure. But you can't make something that's fairly well sealed and think that it's going to be a lot better than being inside. Um, like if you've got a four-sided structure, you probably got worse ventilation potentially than you do inside. So this is where it gets into trying to do transfers as quickly as we can. So we're not doing much time outside with them, bringing in people when they have to come in and maximizing things like telemedicine, hybrid appointments. So the question, I might hit on most aspects of that question in the next couple of slides, but if I don't, I'll certainly come back to it. So like when to allow owners in the clinic is the big challenge. And I think for me, it's not necessarily the question when, it's who. 
because I'm more concerned about that. This isn't binary. This isn't going from no one in the clinic to everyone in the clinic. There's got to be a sweet spot in the middle because there are situations where lighting people in the clinic logistically is probably going to have to, to be the case. But there are a lot of situations where we don't need the people in there. And I've said this a few times, and I'm probably going to say it a bunch of times still, the fewer people that are in the clinic, the better we can do all the things that we want to do to reduce that risk. So when you're thinking about your clinic, you know, regional risk, knowing what's going on in your area, like what's the likelihood someone off the street is positive should play a role of it. If you're a really low risk area, you can take a little more risk and bring people into the clinic. If it's really high, we want more on them outside. Uh, clinic personnel risk factors, like is someone at severe risk or risk of severe disease? Clinic layout, so how well can you manage things inside? If you have a small clinic with poor ventilation, no ability to separate or distance people, you're gonna be more likely to need to keep them outside than if you have a lot of space or better structure. Uh, obviously climate, practicality of alternate approaches, telemedicine, hybrid appointments, curbside. Uh, if people take transit to get to your clinic, uh, it's not different than if people are driving, you have a big parking lot where they can hang out in a nice warm car. Staff comfort with the whole thing, how much staff fear there is. And the clinic's ability or willingness to enforce the rules. Because if you're not willing to enforce the rules, you have to be more restrictive and keep on keeping outside. Because if you get people that'll come in and they'll take their mask off and you're not willing to address that, that's not gonna be a good situation for your staff. And we have to be aware that clinic outbreaks you know, are still happening. You know, I know of multiple outbreaks right now in Canada. Um, you know, community sourced outbreaks, someone brings in, usually it's brought in by, well, probably almost always it's brought in by a staff member who got community sourced disease, but then spreads it within the clinic. But the more people we come in, we see come in the clinic, then we start seeing potential clients associated infections or the other way around, right? What you don't want to do is have public health contact tracing all the clients you saw for the last few days because you were infectious and just found out. So there are a lot of reasons we want to contain that. So overall, the main goals for me, uh, limit the number of people that are ever in the clinic. Limit the number of people in the clinic at any given time, you know, because we have 10 people in the clinic in a day and they're all there at noon. It's not a good scenario, right? We're creating a risk by, by populating. Limit contact between owners and staff uh, and owners and other owners. Minimize the contact time and the time in the clinic. So, you know, more people that are in the clinic, but if they're there not very long, that might be lower risk than, you know, a moderate number of people in the clinic, but they spend a half hour there. Maximize barriers, maximize ventilation while trying to keep the clinic going. And really, you know, I apologize, I keep saying this, but this is really important. I mean, the number of clinic, there, there are people that are in the clinic drives all this. Because if I have a lot of people in the clinic, well, that means there can be more people in the clinic at any time. There's greater chance of contact. It might be less efficient. There's more time in the clinic. Uh, it's hard to get ventilation for, you know, liters per person per minute if you have more people in there. So the more we can keep people out, the better. So the more telemedicine keeps them out completely. The more hybrid appointments. So if they're screened such that, you know, you do the puppy visit by phone, you do all the educational stuff, talk about what we're going to do. And if for some reason that owner has to come in with a dog, all it's coming in for is an exam. We take the dog in the back room, do the exam, vaccinate it, send it back with the owner versus doing that whole spiel, that whole time with the client in the clinic. So even if people have to come in, if we can minimize the time by taking care of as much as we can remotely, that helps. So clinic access, things to think about for clinic access if you start to open up. Um, for me, here's some things where I would think about allowing more clients in. So when you've got a client, you know, you just can't have this discussion over the phone and in the internet. Maybe a complexity of the case, might be a language barrier, might be someone who needs to read visual cues, just needs to be there. Might be someone that has a hard time interpreting things on a phone or online. So there are cases like that. And that's one where, you know, it's all cost benefit. The benefit for you, the benefit for the owner, benefit for the patient is a short visit where we're distanced and we're masked and we're in a well-ventilated area. Um, it might be reasonable. Where owners have to be shown something, you know, teaching them how to inject insulin. Sure, some people could do that um, on, online but not always, monitoring a bandage, certain things they need to look at, certain things they need to see to make a decision. But we can, again, make this short, right? We don't have to have the whole diabetes management visit in clinic in person. You can have that visit by phone and then, okay, pop in, we're gonna spend a couple minutes and we're gonna talk about how to do it, right? as opposed to the whole time there, right? We're minimizing their, minimizing their time, even if they have to come in. Uh, you know, when the owners can't wait outside, so they took transit and you don't have an area they can sit and you know the Tim Hortons isn't close by or it's closed down they can't go inside it they're not going to stand outside waiting in minus 20. 
Um, and patients where the presence of the owner will be helpful. This is kind of timely that you may have heard there was some research published just recently uh, from Lee Neal's group looking at fear response in, in animals with or without clients. And certainly we know, you know, some situations animals are better without their clients, their owners. Um, some situations it might be useful. Now this doesn't change, this isn't a game changer for me and that was kind of my assessment. It's something we need to be aware of, right? We need to think about the animal health, the owner health, the owner behavior, animal behavior aspects of it. So I don't use this to say that, yeah, we absolutely need to let everyone in, but it's part of the decision-making process, right? If there's a reason for that animal to be in there, for that owner to be in there, um, you know, we should try to facilitate that if we're comfortable doing it and if we can do other things well. It's just one more thing to think about. Okay, uh, let's see if I got through questions. So vaccines, uh, really quickly on vaccination. Um, one of the problem, one, you know, it's amazing we've gone from not knowing this disease to having highly effective vaccines of new technology within the same calendar year. Like it really is astounding. Uh, we've got two vaccines that are very good. We've got the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's, I'm not sure what to think about it because their study was a bit weird, but we've got two really effective vaccines that are quite safe overall. Um, but we think about what they're designed to do. Because one of the concerns is we've got people saying, okay, well, vaccines are here, so we're good, right? Well, yeah, we'll be good eventually. We're not gonna be good for a while. But think about what they do. So they're gonna reduce disease severity. What do they do overall, right? Vaccines can reduce disease severity. They can reduce the incidence of disease. They can reduce viral shedding, or ultimately they can be a sterilizing vaccine where they can eliminate infection, prevent infection, and prevent shedding from occurring. That's a pretty big target. So will these vaccines, what, what do we know about these vaccines? Well, they'll reduce the incidence of disease and they do that quite effectively. They won't completely prevent it, but they'll drop the incidence. Will they reduce severity of people that get you know, disease breakthrough? We don't really know, probably. There's probably a protective component there. Does it reduce viral shedding? We don't know this. So does it mean you know, vaccination is gonna help us prevent transmission? Or does vaccination just mean that if I get infected, I'm not gonna get sick, but I'm still gonna be shedding the virus because that can certainly happen with some of our vaccines. We're not gonna get a sterilizing vaccine. I don't think vaccination is not gonna be an elimination tool for this virus. I don't think we're gonna say we vaccinate everyone, this virus will disappear because the virus then can't infect anyone. So we think about vaccination to protect, vaccination to reduce, vaccination to eliminate. Um, we're really looking at vaccination to protect and vaccination to reduce, not vaccination to eliminate, at least with what we have now. But like I said, we've got great vaccines. Canada has licensed Pfizer's vaccine today. Ontario just released that we got 2.4 million doses coming within the first quarter, which you know sounds really good, but 2.4 million doses means 1.2 million people by the end of March in a population of 14 and a half million. So by the end of March, we, we won't have 10% of the population in Ontario vaccinated probably, unless something new comes online. Uh, so it's still like, you don't wanna downplay it. It's remarkable that we can have that much this quickly, but we just have to be aware that vaccines are here. Like I've been saying, if I'm vaccinated in July, I'll be happy. And I'm still pretty much on that line. Like we're gonna hit long-term care residents, healthcare workers, long-term care contacts, and then start working down and where we fit into the whole essential worker or where essential workers go will be interesting to see. But end of 2021 is really the target to get good vaccine coverage. If we can get good vaccine coverage. Um, up there. So one, cause one thing today on the Toronto star said that it was about 55% of people said they were interested or likely going to get vaccinated. So we still have vaccine hesitancy issues to worry about. Uh, question coming up there. Um, definitely on board with getting the vaccine. Some of the staff are not. And this this brings in a lot of, you know, it's going to bring in a lot of legal questions. Can we mandate vaccination? Um, historically, mandating vaccination for something like influenza and healthcare workers hasn't been possible. It's been looked at, it's been tried. You know, as a private facility, you can do things. It's easy to do something for someone that hasn't started on the job yet, saying, here are our, here are our requirements versus someone that's already there. And this is where I think Doug Jack's opinion would be really good because I am far from anywhere competent with legal stuff. But this is gonna be, this is a question that gets talked about a lot is how much can we mandate vaccination? What can you do to someone that's not vaccinated in terms of restriction of duties? Um, Ontario surprisingly just the other day started talking about vaccination certificates. So approving vaccination with, the, with this, the comment that it might enable people to do things like go to theaters. So, you know, there may be some precedent for restricting things for people that don't get vaccinated. 
Um, another question there, if we get vaccinated, we can remove our, remove our masks and get back to work. And that the problem is not necessarily, and that's the concern is that we might get a false sense of security with vaccination. And it comes down to what the vaccine does, right? So if that vaccine prevents you from getting infected full stop, yes, you could do that. If it prevents you from getting sick, but you can still get infected and still infect people, then no. And I don't think we know that well enough right now, because if you can still get infected, but have an asymptomatic infection, then you still need a mask so we don't infect other people that are there. Because there are be some people that won't be vaccinated, and there'll be some people that can't be vaccinated based on their health status. So vaccines aren't gonna be the get out of jail card that means you can do everything. Um, and I think we'll just have to see what kind of, what, what kind of things that we can do and we can't do or how much we can get by with the vaccination. Um, got one more question there, I'll get to, what's the efficacy of the two vaccines that are very effective? Um, the Pfizer vaccines reported at 96%, I believe. Moderna is right around that too. The AstraZeneca vaccine that's farther behind, they had a really screwy study where they reported 90%, but their 90% re rate, they have 90% response rate and a 60% response rate. Their 90% response rate was in people where they screwed up and they only gave them half of the first dose. And their second dose actually occurred quite late. They had a problem with the study design or implementation. So it looked like the half dose followed by a longer lag than the full dose gave them 90% coverage. They only got 60% coverage with their targeted regimen. No one knows why. The study's got some really strange design things. So no one's really sure what to think about the AstraZeneca vaccine. That one's farther on the horizon. Like we're going to see Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Problem with the Pfizer vaccine, this is the one that needs to be kept at minus 80. And they've also come out and said, you have to be careful with jostling it. You know, I mean, don't mix it up and shake it. Uh, it's, it's not tolerant of being bashed around very much. So they, they want to be careful with how it's moved. So there may be some issues in implementation. There aren't a lot of minus 80 freezes around. Um, I've offered up a bunch of mine for public health if they need them, but we have very few facilities with minus 80 freezers. Now you can do dry ice storage. There are a lot of logistical aspects of this Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna vaccine can handle just normal freezing. So that one's got more practical aspects. They're farther behind in the availability pathway. So they're very effective. They seem to be very safe overall. There's been a lot of discussion about safety with the Pfizer vaccine because there have been, there were a couple of allergic reactions in Britain where they just started to roll it out. Two healthcare workers, I think it was had severe allergic reactions. And these are two people that have had a history of allergy, allergic reactions in the past. But, you know, it's going to get picked up on as being an issue. Overall, the adverse event rates were quite low, you know, fairly high, high rate of muscle pain, injection site pain. Um, but overall, not a big risk of, of major adverse effects. We'll see. Uh, maybe that comment, okay, allergic reaction and two recipients were noted. Yeah, so that's what I was just talking about there. And the recommendations, anyone who has a history of, of severe reactions doesn't do it. Yeah, we, and we don't know what the, we don't know what they're responding to. I mean, in our mRNA vaccine, there's not an egg protein component. Um, so it's not clear why they responded. Some people are just more prone to respond to anything. So they've erred on the side of saying, if you have a history of severe allergic reactions, but severe being kind of vague, but instead of, if you need an EpiPen for something, they're saying don't get vaccinated with a Pfizer vaccine. Hopefully they can get vaccinated with a Moderna vaccine where it gets refined a little bit more. Uh, but this is, you know, there's gonna be a lot of change in messaging because this is, you know, it's a new vaccine. It's not a rushed vaccine, right? This is a vaccine. This shows what you can do when there's, you know, effort and money. Like there are no corners cut on these vaccines. Um, there was just a you know, whole hog effort to get in. So it's not like we're trying something that's got less testing, but we're gonna vaccinate an unprecedented number of people in a very short period of time. And small numbers of adverse events are going to get amplified by the media. So it's going to be another challenge for us to get vaccinated a million people. One person gets a problem. That's the person you're going to be talking about. So we are going to have some communications issues. Um, I think there's one question I missed up here. Potential having dogs and cats testing positive for COVID. Do you recommend screening every appointment? or just where the owners are coming into the clinic. Yeah, I recommend screening every appointment. Um, so if it's a curbside, because curbside there still is some degree of contact with the owners, right? It's very, very low risk, but I wanna know the animal. If that cat is coming from an infected household, I'd rather have the cat wait two weeks to come in. Um, and if it can't wait for two weeks, then I'm gonna increase the PPE that we use. 
So it's, it's still a good question. Like, does anyone in your household have COVID? Are you, are you, so basically, I think you have to ask how you ask the question. Does anyone has have COVID? Is anyone being isolated um, pending testing results? So is anyone waiting for test results? So we see a lot of people that have enough impetus to get tested because they've been exposed and they won't do anything until they can become positive. And they spread a lot in the interim. So I think it's worth querying every, every owner of an animal you're going to see. Um, I think this is the last thing I've got, but any other questions, toss up there. So sniffer dogs is an interesting area. Um, I'm working with a couple of groups on these. And, you know, it's, we've been talking about this for months, whether the dogs are pretty remarkable in what they can detect. There are a few different studies in a few different places that have suggested they could be reasonably good. They're being used in an airport in Helsinki and in the United Arab Emirates to try to screen people. Um, Helsinki, they're screening based on sweat swabs. They're, they're not probably going to be able to pick up dogs or people that are walking by infected. But there's an interesting component here. So um, basically, dogs don't smell the virus. They smell our response to the virus. They smell some volatile component that our body produces in response to infection. So it could be saliva, it could be sweat, skin wipes, clothing. We're kind of looking at what the best sample is. We don't really know. And it raises some interesting questions. Like this may be a too little too late, or it might be it's an interesting thing. I think in airports, it's probably not gonna be very useful. Like it's gotta be highly sensitive and specific if you're gonna screen it for that individual person. If you're trying to say, okay, you're going into school or you're going on a plane or you're going into work, we're gonna screen you. Well, it's not really designed for that. What we're thinking, or at least I'm thinking more, it's group environment. So you can go into a shelter, you can go into a, a workplace, you can go into a migrant farm housing situation and the dog can say, yeah, something's up here. Right? So you can sniff around clothing or people saying, okay, I've got a positive. That means we have to come in and do proper testing. So we're not going to have line up everyone and sniff everyone down the line and say, you go there, you go there. It's going to be, hmm, something's wrong here. Here's how we need to target our testing. That's more likely what they'll be possible for. Ultimately, it may depend if we have rapid low-tech antigen tests. Right? If you have a snap test equivalent where you spit in this, you press it down, and five minutes later, it says positive or negative, um, that will you know, be, be that will supplant dogs. But we've been very slow in getting these rolled out. Antigen tests, these rapid tests are not as sensitive, but they're kind of the same approach as I was saying for the dog, they're there to get a general snapshot of what's going on. So are there a bunch of people, the odd person, or no one probably infected versus is it 12 or 13? Or is it, are you able to go and you're not able to go? That's not really what they're for. They're trying to say, is there a situation here? Unless we get really sensitive tests. Like ultimately you get the test that's 100% sensitive and you can take it before you go to work every day or go on a plane or go on a bus, but we're not quite there yet. Um, can back up a couple more questions there. Let's put this up for anyone that's taking off. As always, don't be afraid to track me down. Um, my email address is there. Email is usually the best way to get a hold of me. So if it's urgent, put urgent in the title so I'll pay attention quicker. Uh, a couple more questions there. Is there work happening developing vaccines for cats and dogs? Yeah, it's a good question. So yes, there is. There have been a couple of companies that are working on it, uh, including kind of a mainstream pharma company plus one kind of vague startup in the US. The question is, would anyone vaccinate against it? What of your clients are gonna spend 50 bucks to vaccinate their, their dog or their cat against COVID? Probably not for my take. Um, you know, dogs don't get sick very often. And if they get sick, they probably get mildly sick. So, and dogs probably don't affect people. So you can probably chuck dogs off the thing. Cats, you know, cats are more interesting. Cats can get sick and cats, some cats will get seriously ill. Cats can potentially spread it to people, but you know, most cats are gonna get sick. Most cats aren't gonna get very sick. And are people going to bring the animal in for a vaccine, add it to their vaccination regimen for a disease that's really minor when they're not vaccinating against more serious things already? Now, the public health component where it might be a bigger issue. Cats, you know, they're not likely to be a reservoir, right? They're not gonna be a long-term reservoir, so we can toss that out. And cats, you know, if they infect people, it's probably in defined circumstances. You know, the, the biggest reason to vaccinate cats would be to protect veterinarians. So if there's COVID in the household, the cats aren't bringing it in. Now it's pretty hard sell. I, so I think it's unlikely we're gonna see, you know, well, vaccines work probably. You can take the technology that's been done in humans and transpose it over animals very easily. Uh, the human technology is really expensive, which is part of the issue, but they're probably cheaper or less effective approaches that would work. I just don't see a demand for it. Um, you know, would I spend 50 bucks to vaccinate my cats, my dog against this virus? Probably not. Um, what do you advise, what do you recommend we advise staff who have domestic travel plans in 2021? Well, I would say don't. Um, who knows what's going to happen, right? I think 
you've got to be considering, you've got to build in a quarantine period for any time you move from one run risk area to another risk area. So it really depends on what's going on, right? If they go, it depends what travel is. So someone's going, you know, camping by themselves, that's not travel. Someone's getting on a plane, someone's going to a different area, someone's going to a different risk area, and that's bringing in some risk. Someone that's visiting family in another province is probably higher risk than someone that's going on vacation because they're probably having closer, longer term contacts with family than they are with the general population. So I think really we need to be thinking about the default being a 10 or 14 day exclusion period when someone gets back from a high risk activity. And you know, domestic travel may be as risky as US travel in certain times of the year in certain places in the country. Uh, like right now, if someone went from PEI to Alberta, absolutely, that's a high risk thing and they're gonna be subject to quarantine when they get back. So I, I think you need to be talking to staff about that. I don't know what 2021 is gonna bring, but I don't think we're gonna say that we're gonna be able to drop a lot of these restrictions until well into the end of 2021, because we're not gonna have good vaccine coverage. Now, there might be some situations that might be, you know, maybe vaccination is really protective and they're going to a low risk area and things like that. So maybe it will be possible, but I think the default saying is as of now, you know, if, if you're planning on leaving, planning on figure, plan on figuring how you're going to do 14 days working from home, or another 14 days off, because we just don't know what's going to happen. And, and that's that's a tough HR aspect, absolutely. I just, it's too hard to predict what's going to happen. Uh, did we get through all the questions? I think we did. Yeah. So it's a bit of a whirlwind. I usually end up talking more than I thought I would, but um, yeah. And it's, like I said, don't be afraid to ask if anyone has questions. Let me know. Obviously, if, if you have animals, we can test serologically, let me know. We'd love to do that. I think there was another question just came through the chat. Uh, session VR, Lori could tell you that. Yes, I believe it's um, archived. Thank you for using crap load and webinar. I do that a lot, actually. <laughs> there are a lot there. <laughs> Thanks, a lot. Thanks, everyone. Back to you, Edith. Thank you very much, Scott. Really, uh, very much appreciate always your, your insight. This was great, especially with respect to ventilation, taking the time to go through that with us and, and explaining some of the aspects of vaccinations, which I know we have so many <laughs> questions about. Um, I again want to just uh, reiterate that these will be available for you uh, on our uh, landing page, so they'll be recorded. Uh, we should have them up by next week. We are certainly hoping to have uh, another one of these and, and more in the future after the new year. So we don't have a date yet, but be watching your email and our Facebook page uh, for an update on that. Um, and again, I just wish everybody has a very safe and happy holidays coming up. Uh, we at the CVMA are, are so supportive of all of the work that you all are doing in every capacity as veterinary professionals, as family members, as, as parents. Uh, please continue uh, to make us proud because we are very proud. And thank you again, Scott. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all uh, in the new year. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone gets a good break.